Good evening. Do you love the Lord Jesus Christ? Say amen. 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 Would you stand with me all over the church house? Just prior to us getting started, I know that there are many still cleaning up over there. What a wonderful meal we've had. We've been fed physically, now we're going to be fed spiritually. But I see visitors, I see guests, and we want to welcome you here at Oklahoma Missionary Baptist Church tonight. Now note that tonight is not the last night of revival, but it is the last night that Brother Larry is going to be with us bringing us the message. Revival should continue to carry on long after this evening. And that's what, that's what revival is really all about, the rippling effect, the carrying on and continuance. But I see visitors, I see guests, and I tell you what, when you leave from this place, I want folks to say two things. They love the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, with all their heart, mind, body, and soul, and they really love other people. So let's just take just a few moments while others are still coming in to just get to know one another, shake a few hands, cross the aisle, and say, glad you're here. Would you do that right now, please? Good afternoon. Welcome to our Wednesday evening service. If everyone would, please get a red book, stand, turn to page 208.
church tonight. <clears throat> Excuse me. Yes, ma'am. I'm just going to take Kelly off. Okay. Okay. I got a call this afternoon from my sister, Kim. She's requesting prayer. She went to the doctor today, and uh, they found out that she's got something in her eyes. She's got to go to Lexington in the morning and have uh, another test on her eyes because it's affecting her vision. So I'd like y'all to remember her. What's her last name? Kim uh, Hammond. I'm sorry, Hammond. Anyone else? Yes, sir. Okay. Unspoken? Yes, ma'am. <laughs> Conley Chapman. Conley. Anyone else? Any praise reports? Had an incredibly blessed week having Brother Larry here with us. Yes, sir. Amen. Yes, sir. Also last night, I uh, had an ordination service for a young man who was pastor in Pleasant Point Baptist Church. And just so excited to see someone surrender to the call and be willing to go into service. Amen. So, uh, Brother Steve Murray, could I get you left these requests at please? Everyone would please turn to page 194. When we get this done, we'll turn it over to Brother Larry. He's going to do a special. When Brother Larry's done, Nancy and Deb's going to do a special. And then we'll turn it back over to Brother Larry.
Sometimes the days get long And they're filled with care But I just go to Him And with each prayer Oh, He bids me stay And He gives new strength to me He bought my soul through death at Calvary Each drop of His blood bought me a million years soul was born each time he shed a tear he loosed those chains that fettered you and me he bought my soul at Calvary He bought my soul through death at Calvary Sister Deborah, come on up.
color. Can you say praise the Lord? Praise the Lord. Amen. I tell you what, has this been as wonderful a week for you as it has been for me? Give the Lord a good hand clap of praise tonight. Hey, Amen. I tell you what, I just sit over there and thinking, man, this has been a wonderful week. I said, thank you, Lord. I needed this. Amen. And I tell you, it's been such a great honor and privilege to have been with you at each night this week. Started out Sunday, and the Lord has blessed us in a mighty way. You all made us feel at home and uh, feel like that you love us. And I tell you, we've not met anybody that, that we felt anything any different from. And before we even came here, I knew because of the man that you have as your leader, uh, if I lived close enough, this is where I'd be going to church. But after spending this week with you, I know this is where I would be going to church. <laughs> and, uh, and especially after that meal. I mean, man alive. I'd just come for the fish and the bread. I mean, the fish and the loaves, wouldn't you? <laughs> if for nothing else. But... I tell you, we've been blessed beyond measure by your hospitality and your kindness and your words of encouragement, and we appreciate you very much for allowing us the opportunity uh, to come into your congregation and to minister to you. We uh, love Brother Jason and Susan and Caleb and Megan and the whole family, and uh, we just appreciate you very much for allowing us to come and be part of your family this week. Amen. And uh, we just love you and bless you in the name of the Lord and pray that when we leave, if revival ends tonight, uh, then I feel like I've failed in my mission. And uh, revival is to linger. Revival is something that stirs us up. And when you come back in this place on Sunday morning, that same fire is burning and ready to start off for a fresh work. And uh, if I could encourage you to do anything... And I've been in the ministry for over 30 years. I, I felt called to preach, started preaching in 1986. I was still in high school. And if there's anything I could encourage you to do, it will bless your family, it will bless your home, and it will bless your church. You honor the man and woman of God. You honor them, God will honor you. If they got a problem, you pray for them, God will straighten them out. But you bless them. You honor great leadership and you've got a great leader and family that you should be proud of. Give them a hand tonight. <laughs> Appreciate my mother for being here tonight and she's been here about every night but last night and, uh, and a couple of folks, uh, Barb and Mitch from our church, traveling with her tonight. Appreciate them and her friend Kathy and uh, niece and sister-in-law, right? Good to have them tonight. Amen. Appreciate them being here. And I'll just tell you, they sometimes, how many knows life gets a little rough? Gets a little hectic. I don't care how saved and sanctified you are. And uh, sometimes it's just hard to work and travel and do all these things. And there's been a many a times that uh, my wife, we've just been covered up. She couldn't make it. Uh, but not one time. I couldn't even get her to stay home this week. So that says a lot about you. And uh, so uh, she's been blessed by being here, and I want her to say a little something to you tonight. Amen. We would like to thank Jason and Susan for their loving We have uh, some folks, and when Brother Jason was at his, at his other congregation, uh, we took and put the name of their congregation on our pulpit, and we prayed for them at the beginning of every service, and we'll do the same for you. Uh, hey, I'm not a jealous preacher. I'm not jealous against other preachers. I'm not jealous against other churches. I believe that we're on the same team tonight. And, uh, you know, we should be together in this effort to serve God. We're trying to win people to the Lord 
And uh, we should be in this together. No, no matter what denomination may hang over our doors, we ought to be trying to win people for Christ. And that's our heart's desire tonight. And we thank you for allowing us to come and be with you this week. If you have your Bibles and you're able to stand, I'd like to ask you to stand. Turn to the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 1. First Corinthians chapter 1. We hope that maybe one day you'll ask us to come back. We'd like to come back and visit. And, and uh, probably whether you ask or not, we'd like to pop in here some Sunday and just, just visit with you. So you never know. First Corinthians chapter 1. I'm going to begin reading with verse number 17 to start out with. Then we're going to go to... Uh, Chapter 2, just for a few short verses. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, begin with verse 17. Apostle Paul said, For Christ sent me not to baptize, but to preach the gospel. Now the old preacher I came up and under used to quote this to me every time when we was baptizing, especially when it was cold and there's ice on the water. He said, Christ didn't send me to baptize, he made me get out there. But he said, Christ sent me not to baptize, but to preach the gospel, not with wisdom of words, lest the cross of Christ should be made of none effect. For the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness, but unto us which are saved, it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and will bring to nothing the understanding of the prudent. Where is the wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the disputer of this world? Hath, God, hath not God made foolish the wisdom of this world? For after that in the wisdom of God, the world by wisdom knew not God. It pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. For the Jews require a sign and the Greeks seek after wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified unto the Jews a stumbling block and unto the Greeks foolishness. But unto them which are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. Because the foolishness of God is wiser than men. And the weakness of God is stronger than men. Now if you'll go to chapter 2. Verse number 1. And I, brethren, when I came to you, came not with excellency of speech or of wisdom, declaring unto you the testimony of God. For I determined not to know anything among you, save Jesus Christ and Him crucified. And I was with you in weakness and in fear and in much trembling. And my speech and my preaching was not with enticing words of man's wisdom, but in the demonstration of the Spirit and of power, that your faith should not stand in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. And the church said, Amen. Amen. You can be seated tonight. In the year 212 B.C., there was a very strange book that was published. And the man that wrote the book, the author, was just as strange, if not more strange, than the book he published. Because in this book, the author dedicated to the king of Syracuse on the southern coast of Sicily. In this book, he sought to calculate how many grains of sand it would take to fill the entire universe. Now I'll stop a second and let that run up and hit you right quick. He dedicated this book to the king of Syracuse and he was trying to calculate how many grains of sand it would take to fill the whole universe. Some people is so smart they ain't got no sense. But this was one of the last things the man did before he died. He contemplated the number of the grains of sand it would take to fill the universe. 
The name of the book was called The Sand Reckoner. And it was, like I said, written just before this man died. He died when his city came under siege by a Roman general whose nickname was the Sword of Rome. And that general's name was Marcus Claudius Marcellus. And when he brought his troops, matter of fact, it was the whole Roman navy to move against the citadel of Syracuse. He was utterly astonished at the resistance that he faced when he came to the siege. His crew had to work feverishly to keep the troops from giving in to utter discouragement. Because to their astonishment, they encountered war machines that had never been seen before. Far more sophisticated than anything that they had in the Roman territory up to that point. One of the war machines was the catapult, which was a fantastic a form of weaponry in that day, but another one, most certainly more astonishing, was that as the Roman ships was approaching the cliffs outside of Syracuse, the sailors looked up to the sky and they saw these huge jaws descending out of, uh, out of the sky. And the jaws came down and it gripped one of the Roman ships and picked it up in the air and tossed it onto the rocks while the sailors in the other ship stood in utter astonishment. I couldn't even imagine. They couldn't believe what they were seeing until the jaws moved to another ship, gripped another ship and picked it up and smashed it into smithereens onto the rocks. And the sailors under Marcus Claudius Marcellus were terrified. Finally, the Romans were victorious and the command of the sword of Rome was given that the engineer that developed these weapons was to be caught unharmed. But the mandate was ignored by one of the foul and ranked soldiers who was annoyed so much by this man's ingenuity. He approached this man as he was doing mathematical equations in the sand and killed him on the spot. And that's how Archimedes met his death. In Archimedes' book, The Sand Reckoner, which seemed to be, to us today, would be completely absurd estimated the number of the grains of sand it would take to fill the entire universe. The amazing thing to me that I found was that it matched almost exactly to the estimates of 20, 20th century physicists not too many years ago in 212 B.C. It's probably safe to say that Archimedes was one of the most brilliant men that ever walked the face of this earth. And you may remember that when he spoke to the king of Syracuse on one occasion, when the king was amazed at all these machines and all these inventions that uh, Archimedes had designed, Archimedes said to the king, Give me a lever long enough and a place to stand and I can move the whole world. A little over 200 years after Archimedes made that statement, a lever was found that was long enough to move the world. It was a tree about 10 feet high. And the place that it was placed was Calvary. Because the cross was the lever that turned the world upside down. It was the cross that was the lever that was able to move the whole world. It was the cross that revealed the power, not of the ingenuity of Archimedes, but the power of God Himself to make right a topsy-turvy world. And it was that message of the cross that has changed this world forever 2,000 years ago. Amen. Now the cross, according to the apostle, as he teaches here in 1 Corinthians... 
had a visible and an invisible significance. I've become recently uh, uh, interested in a book that we've heard of and, and, and heard a lot about in, when we were in school, but I was not an avid reader in school, and one of the biggest things I've struggled with with being a minister is reading, because I hate to read. And um, I took a few classes back uh, this past year or two, and in that I, I took a writing class, and for some reason I got interested, and all of a sudden, bam, I'm reading everything. I mean, I got a, I got a student discount to get the, the Wall Street Journal. I mean, there ain't no funnier sight to see a hillbilly walking down the road carrying the Wall Street Journal. <laughs> I don't need nobody to laugh at me. I laughed at myself. But I just became intrigued with reading. I've bought books. I've read books. And I'm like, man, this is like a newfound thing for me. And uh, it took me 50 years to get there, but I finally got there. But a book that has been interesting to me was uh, the book that most of you will know, wrote by Herman Melville, Moby Dick. There's a portion in that story where Ahab, the monomaniacal quest to find the albino whale, he's running out of patience. And he's on the brim of hysteria. And in his passionate desire to find Moby Dick, he wants to post a reward for the first person on board the ship that would sight this horrible monster. So Ahab went to the main mast of the ship and he took out a hammer and a nail and he nailed the gold doubloon on the mast of the ship. And he said, whosoever spots the whale first and sights, there she blow, will get the gold doubloon. And then what follows from that moment in the novel is an insight from Melville as to what happens at the center of the ship. All the crew members come out and they look at the main mass and they see the gold doubloon and they all begin to think and express what it meant to them and what they could do with it if they got that gold coin. How many cigars it would buy and what riches would be theirs. And they all had a completely different view of what that gold coin represented. It was totally subjective. Until the cabin boy, Bip, came along and he kind of sort of danced around the main mass, making fun. And he said, I see, you see, we all see. And he made fun of the crew members because they all had a different view of the significance of that gold coin. When I think about that story, I cannot help but think about the Apostle Paul's writing and consider the New Testament account of the cross of Christ. Caiaphas looks at it and he's the one that said it is expedient for one man to die for the good of a nation. For him, it was an event of political expediency to get the Romans off their back. Pilate looks at it also from the vantage point of expediency, but he looks at it in the reverse. When he says, if I give Jesus over to the people and they kill him, then it will quiet this tumultuous mob of Jews and keep them under control. But then the centurion looked at him and said, surely this man was the Son of God. Some people saw an execution of an imposter. Others saw the destruction of a dream. But if you were standing there that day at the cross, and you were observing the death of Jesus on that tree, would you have seen in that one event the act of redemption? Would you have witnessed the death of this Jew, the propitiation of of a holy God to a perfect sacrifice? Would you have seen in that event the redemption of sin for all that would put their faith in Him? Folks, it was invisible to anyone that would have been a spectator that day. How do we know the cross is the supreme act of redemption? 
Its meaning and significance was not outwardly visible to those that were in the flesh. To them it was foolishness. Because it was not known through the wisdom of the world. It didn't make sense to them. It could not be known save through the special revelation of Almighty God. From all outward appearances it seems to display the weakness of this man called Christ. But yet the the apostle says it is the power of God. The power of God to turn the world upside down. The power of God to turn you upside down. The power of God to turn me upside down. And then Paul goes into chapter 2. And in chapter 2 Paul says, When I came to you, I did not come to you in excellency of speech or wisdom, for I determined not to know anything among you except Jesus Christ and Him crucified. Now, there is a sense in which the apostle is speaking here that seems like it is almost a hyperbole. Because Paul spent much of his time explaining things about the kingdom of God. He talked about the resurrection. He talked about the ascension. He talked about the return of Christ. He talked about justification. He talked about sanctification and all those things. But yet here Paul says, when I came, I determined I didn't want to know anything among you save Christ and Him crucified. It can sound like a and hyperbole, but if you examine the depths and the riches of the cross, I believe you'll find that everything that the apostle was speaking of and preaching was simply a footnote to the central affirmation of the cross of Christ. It is the resurrection of Jesus Christ that demonstrates the efficacy of the cross. And the rest of all these other things, everything goes back and ties in to the cross. But from a human perspective, notice what Paul says. When I came to you, he says, I was with you. And boy, that's what we want in our pastors, ain't it? He said, I was with you. That our pastors not be against us. That our pastors not be above us or away from us. But Paul said, we were with you. Paul said, I was with you in weakness, in fear, and in much trembling. And my speech and preaching was not with enticing words of human wisdom, but in the demonstration of the Spirit and the power of God, that your faith would not stand in the wisdom of men, but in the power of the living God. I heard about a Southern Baptist convention several years ago down in uh, Florida, I forget the city. Big convention that was going on, and the media made a heyday of the Southern Baptists. Made them, just uh, made them look like fools. Mocked them, made fun of them in the papers. You know how the world is. The world has no clue. They have no, they have no understanding. That's the wisdom of the world. You can write for the Wall Street Journal. You can write for the New Yorker magazine. You can write for all these things, be the big wheel up there in New York City. You can work for the CBS, ABC, and NBC and all those things. But they have no understanding. They may have a Ph.D., a college degree, several master's degree, but they have no knowledge of the spiritual things of God. Paul said, when I came to you, I didn't come to you in excellency of speech or wisdom of men. And he could have. Paul was no idiot. In much of our churches today and uh, uh, in many places in, in our world today, here in Kentucky especially, I've been in a lot of churches and, and uh, they almost give you the impression the poor you are and the dumber you are, the closer to God you are. That's not always true. Paul was very educated. There was nobody that could win a debate with him. Paul knew what he was talking about. Paul could have came to them in the excellency of speech and in wisdom. But Paul said, I chose not to do that because it's not about me. It's not about my wisdom. It's not about my training. The only thing that I want to express to you is the cross of Jesus Christ. For it is the power of the living God unto salvation today. Give the Lord a hand clap of praise.
There was an article written during that week about the Southern Baptist stand against women. And the article said something to the effect, the same book in which Paul said that he would not allow a woman to have authority over a man also tells women not to have braided hair. And the Baptists are all exercised about ordaining women, yet they don't say a thing about the braids and the women hair that they are wearing. They really don't believe the Bible. Well, there's an expert in hermeneutics. <laughs> the world don't understand the cross. They don't understand God and they don't understand His Word. But if you love the cross, and if I love the cross, and if you love the gospel, why? If you don't see it as utter foolishness and utter weakness, why not? Probably one of the greatest theologians that ever lived, and I'm sure that you would agree, greatest philosopher, one of the greatest preachers ever walked the face of the earth was Jonathan Edwards. And when you hear the name Jonathan Edwards, immediately the sermon that comes to your mind probably is sinners in the hands of an angry God, if you uh, know anything about your church history. But what put Jonathan Edwards on the map theologically was a different sermon. A sermon that he preached much earlier than the sermon sinners in the hands of an angry God. And that sermon was entitled, A Divine and supernatural light. Where Edwards talked about the sweetness and the excellency of the ministry of the Holy Spirit. Who illuminates our heart and mind that we may see the sweetness and the wisdom of the cross. Without the Spirit of God removing the scales from our eyes, we would never behold the loveliness of Christ. We would spend our time marching in protest around the assembly of Christian believers. But Paul goes in into this second chapter when he says in verse 6, We speak wisdom among them that are mature. But it's not the wisdom of this age, nor the rulers of this age who are coming to nothing. <coughs> I think one of the greatest threats to the church world today in which we live is based in our profound desire to be accepted to the secular culture. I'm going to say that again so that it kind of, it's like water in the garden. I want it to sink in. I think one of the greatest threats to the church today is our overwhelming desire to be acceptable to the secular culture. Why has the church changed so much? Because we're trying to conform to make the world comfortable. We're trying to make God more acceptable to the world when we should be making the world more acceptable unto God. Amen. We want to be accepted. Nobody wants to be looked like as a fool. A lot of folks embarrassed to be seen at church. A lot of folks to be embarrassed to sing at church or be seen on television or, the, or heard on the radio associated with the church. It embarrasses them because they think that the world belittles the church. And there's a profound desire in our church world. Nobody wants to be deemed a fool. Been in the ministry for a while. And I've had the opportunity to rub shoulders. I'm not educated. I'm not very talented. I'm not very smart in this world system. But I have, I have sat down across the table from some pretty intelligent men. I did tonight. And, and that's, I, that's sincere for me. I, I have great respect for your pastor. And I hold him highly intelligible. I hold him highly respectful in my heart and in my mind. But there are many that I've sat across the table from educated, highly educated ministers and that is the greatest moral weakness among them is the intimidation of the world to look stupid in front of them. 
fear of being thought less of than academically acceptable. To hold such positions in the Bible as the infallibleness of the Bible or the exclusiveness of Christ or the inspiration of the Scriptures. Ideas that the world completely abhors. So many times what we usually do in many cases is we just wimp out. We lose our courage because we don't want to be thought of as being weak. But who is weak? We're not weak, Paul said. I am with you in weakness and the strength of God is greater than our weaknesses. I read of a Christian educator who went to be with the Lord not too many years ago who said, when looking at the landscape of the Christian evangelical world, he said, we are surrounded by wimps. And I've thought of that and I've prayed and I've said, oh God, don't let me be a wimp. Don't let me be a wimp in the kingdom of God. Don't let me be a coward. And when the world runs hostile toward us, don't let me cower out. When the world laughs and the world considers me a fool, what else would I rather be than a fool for Jesus Christ today? That's the greatest honor you can possibly ever have is to be a fool for Christ. For this foolishness, Paul said, is the wisdom of of God. Think about it. Think about how utterly ridiculous that it is. Now, you know, I stand here and preach and you have no idea about my background. You don't know nothing about me. And, and unless I open my mouth too much, you don't know how really dumb I am. You sat there and you wonder, did this guy go to school? Where did he go to school at? And, you know, he'll Billy flaps out a few big words and you're like, oh. But, you know, I had to sit for months and say them over and over just to be able to pronounce them. I had to do a book report, 10-page book report on Frieda Schleimacher. You don't have to write that several times. But if you've seen me in my normal element, sometimes I get so passionate at our church and I get so, so wound up at our church I'll get to preaching, I'll tell, my, I'll tell my congregation, I'll say, oh, look out church, I'm starting to slobber at the mouth. And I literally will be. Because I preach passionately. Because I believe it. I love it. And I preach with passion. But Paul said, God chose the foolishness of preaching. You see a man up here slobbering and spitting and slinging his arms and shouting glory to God. Hallelujah. Jesus saves and he died for your sin. If you think about it educatedly, if you think about it as, as people with great education, it is utter foolishness. But for most of us this evening sitting in these pews, it was that foolishness that got down in the depths of our soul and allowed God to get a hold of our heart and change us forever by the power of the living God. God chose the foolishness of preaching to save men's souls. The world may think it's foolish. Let them think on. But it's the only thing that's going to save them today. Folks, the world's never been on our side and they never will. Paul said we speak wisdom among those that are mature, not the wisdom of this age nor the rulers of this age because they're coming to nothing. Why would you be concerned five minutes about political correctness? I have no intentions of ever offending anybody intentionally. But if I quote a scripture from this book and it bothers you, I don't know what to tell you. I don't know what to tell them. The world despises this book. Why? Because to them it's foolishness. But unto us it's the power of God. The ideologies and the philosophies and the worldviews that mark this present world, God said, they'll come to nothing. 
Oh, the old preacher I came up and under used to say, the Word of God will stand when the world's on fire. Hallelujah. With this, I'm going to close. You want to turn the world upside down? You want to be able to move the world? Then look at the world through the eyes of Jesus. It should be the goal of every Christian in their sanctification to be so nurtured and so grounded in the Word of God, in the revelation of the truth of God, that when we come to a place where we love Jesus and we love what Jesus loves and we hate what Jesus hates, we embrace what Christ embraces, we reject what Christ rejects. And that's, what off, that's what's offered by the Holy Spirit to every believer. So that you don't come to the cross like the crew of the Bequad came to the Gold de Bloom. It says, you see, I see, we all see. But we see Christ. We all see the same thing. We see Christ and we see Him crucified. There's a scripture that I don't, I don't, I won't take the time. I don't, won't take the time to get into it. But you remember where that Paul says that uh, that the Spirit of God searches the deep things of God. You recall that the Spirit of God searches the deep things of God. Now to read that just right off the top, uh, the world may read it. The uneducated may read it. The unspiritual may be able to read it. The babes in Christ may read it. That there's something that the Spirit of God don't know, so He's searching the deep things of God, trying to figure it out and trying to understand it. Kind of what it goes across that, right? But we know that's not the case. Because everything God the Father knows, God the Spirit knows. He don't have to search them out. But the searching that He does is for you and for me. When I did not know Christ and I did not know God, God sent His Spirit to illuminate my mind, to allow my mind to search the deep things of God and things that the natural eye and the natural world and the natural man cannot see or understand. They are spiritually discerned. The Holy Spirit illuminates it in our minds today. We see Jesus Christ not in this pluralist, pluralistic American view of one way among many, but we see Jesus as the only begotten of the Father. We see Jesus Christ as the sole mediator between God and man. There's nobody else that was ever crucified for my sins. And that's what the church has lost today. I'm not talking about Oklahoma. I'm talking about the church in general. She's lost her focus on the cross. On the cross. And when we come back and see the cross, the way God, the Word of God reveals the cross to us, the Spirit of God opens our eyes to its meaning and we see ourselves in light of the cross. Then, maybe then, people will talk about us like they did the people that turned the world upside down. Will you stand with us all over the house? As your pastor comes tonight, my desire and my prayer is that God would give us a lever long enough and strong enough and a place to stand that we can move the world. And He's done that. But I fear that we've dropped the lever and we've moved from the standing point. And the world is no longer moved at our message. The message has not changed. The power of God has not changed. That God would give us a new passion for the cross and help us to recognize the crucifixion of Jesus Christ and its power to save the world. And may God help us to shine His light in our lives to a world that's getting darker every day. And it may seem odd. It may seem unusual. Some of the things that we do, some of the some of the tact to uh, to say, come and accept Jesus Christ, accept the cross of Calvary. 
We're willing to do whatever it takes to be made to look like a fool, to do whatever it takes. But I want to encourage you tonight. What are you willing to do? Are you willing to come down to this altar? Are you willing to stand and make a public profession of faith to say, I don't understand it, it all doesn't come to me right now, but I just know I must admit, believe, and confess in the blood of Jesus Christ. And I don't understand it all, at all. But I'm willing to be led by the Spirit of God and taught by the Spirit of God and do that which He's asked me to do. Tonight, we continue to give this invitation night after night. And you may have been standing there or seated there at this time frame saying, I know I need to go. I know I should go. But what is it that's holding you back? Are you worried what others may think? Are you worried what God thinks? Are you worried about what the old devil thinks? The choice is yours tonight. The invitation is open. Tonight, you want to come, you just want to praise God, just come. Just come and thank you. Maybe tonight you need to make that one-on-one -on -one decision. Today is a day of salvation. Don't worry about what anybody else is thinking, but worry about what God is thinking. Amen. And you stand accountable before Him as the invitation is now given. Let us sing. I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back. No turning back. No turning back. No
You are in control, and you've got whatever situation folks are dealing with. But you are our God. And Lord, we pray your Holy Spirit just kindle the fire that is within us. May we be set ablaze. May we be so bright that people want to say, I want what they have, and I must go and get what they've got, and I want to study that which they study. This opportunity right now to come to the altar, a place of sacrifice, and lay it down in Jesus' name. Verse number two. Though none go with me, I still go God tonight. I do. What you got to praise God for? I do. And I, I, love, I love my daddy. All right. Yeah. Well, I'm going to pray for them because he's Somebody else tonight. You want to praise the Lord? Just want to praise you. Oh, praise the Lord for letting me come back tonight. I missed yeah. yesterday due to a little bit of illness, but I got over it. And me and Jared's had uh, security this week. And what all we got to hear we was out there listening to it out there on, on his phone a while ago. You've been a blessing. Thank you for coming. Thank you for all your songs. Thank all the ladies for their specials. we got a bunch of special people in here that can, can sing and, and bring the word. And I want to thank you all and tell you I love you. And it's a pleasure being here. Yes. I'd like to let you know that my friends, my neighbor next door, I'm going to try to visit our church. Are they really? I am too. I know how she feels. I'm going to be excited. I know how she feels. 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 I and uh, not to embarrass, not to hurt, not to single out, anything like that. But I do feel this. Larry has been an inspiration to me. And, and I've shared this. Y'all heard some of the testimony beforehand. But when I got saved, I wasn't very lovable. And, uh, and God loved me. And Larry looked beyond my faults and saw my needs. He not only baptized me, he befriended me. And he befriended me, and he's helped me, and he has been an inspiration. The desire and the passion that's within his heart, I, I know that he's poured out into so many individuals and into their lives. But for Larry and Laura, I know that their heart's desire is to just proclaim the gospel, to share the good news. I'm humbled to be a part of a church to where 
the deacons come every service. If they're not here, something something's happened. And you men are inspirational. Many others have been able to be here every night. Some have had to work. I realize that. But I am going to ask, because these are God-fearing individuals, God-fearing men, and I'm going to ask Larry and Laura to come up front, and I want us to be able to pray over them. And I'm going to ask our deacons, if they would, if they would just come forward, and I'm going to ask you all to extend as well. But that God would just keep them faithful, keep them strong, protect them and watch care over them. John, please. Mark, you holler at Mark. He's gone. He's gone. You he had, he had to leave. I understand. And guys, if y'all would, would you just come on up here? I know John's coming as well. I want us to just take some time because uh, shame on us. If we ask God to do something. God does something. God delivers. God brought the messengers this week. They've made faithful. They've had the, 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 the spiritual storms that they fought through to be here, to get here, and to deliver the word that God has for them. I'm thankful for it. And as a result of being thankful, we need to pray for them, the ministry, and the work that they're doing. Would you all join with us as I'm going to ask, Leland, would you lead this prayer and just uh, as we all just pray over them, okay? Heavenly Father, I want to say thank you for this week. Thank you for Brother Larry and his wife and his church support. Father, I pray that we can support him even though we're not at his church, but we can pray for him and, and support him, Father, because we know you're all knowing, you're all powerful. Father, I pray that we help them to help his ministry to grow and that we can be a lighthouse to him, that we can be for this community as well. Father, I pray that we will touch them, that we that you will touch them, Father, in a special way. Father, anoint them, and I pray their anointing. Father, thank you for them. Thank you for this church, and thank you, Father, for each one that's here. And those people that are people, your people, Father, that will uplift them and help them, give them strength, support them, and all that you do. Father, I pray that we'll be with our pastor and support him likewise and his family. In Jesus' name we pray and we ask these things. Amen. Amen. I want to say thank you all for that. One last and final note is uh, we just want to love on them, let them know how much we appreciate them. Mark, do you have a helper to take this door here? Uh, is what? No, but I'm sure, like, sure you can get one. Each and every night what we've been able to do is we have been able to take up an offering to contribute our, our appreciation for it, it is uh, biblical that we set aside an offering to be able to be contributed, make that out to Oklahoma Missionary Baptist Church. We'll write one check out to Brother Larry. He didn't come here for that. That's not why he's here. But I believe that it's only right that we just show our love and respect towards him and for him being able to come. So you all have been a great congregation. I can't wait to see what God is still going to do in and through you. Brother Larry. I just want to say one more time. Come on. What are you doing Sunday? No, <laughs> we'll just all load up. We're going to go over there Sunday and we'll have a good time. No. Hey, speaking of announcements, if we would, Brian, I'll let you start those announcements rolling again. Uh, as you're, as before we dismiss and um, just very, very humbled uh, before we dismiss, I'm going to ask Brother Roy to come back again. I'm going to ask him to pray over our offering and dismiss us. But we do have Vacation Bible School that's going to be up and coming here very, very soon. This Sunday, Memorial Day weekend, don't miss it. Uh, if you have a home church, be there. Be there. Get in and get, dig in and dig in deep and be a help. And if you don't have one, you found one now. And we want to welcome you here. If you're, uh, if you're here visiting, we want to make sure you know how appreciative we are for you being with us. Brother Roy's going to close us out in a word of prayer and also praying over our offering. Stay as long as you like and love on your neighbor, if you would.
Our Heavenly Father, we recognize you as the master power. It's not about me. It's not about Pastor. It's not about Larry, Father. It's about you. And may you receive the honor and glory from all the messages. I pray that this offering that we're accepting today, Father, would further his ministry. God, we want to tell you that we love you with all of our heart today and all of our mind and all of our soul. And the world does enter in and try to stop that. And I pray that Satan would be defeated even in our own lives. I'm so thankful for every single person in this room. It's not an accident that they're here. And Father, I'm thankful for the children. The smallest one. I'm thankful for the oldest person here. You love every soul the same. And Father, our soul does not age. It's not that we have a body with a soul, Father, but we have a soul that you've given us a body to, and we'll live forever. I pray we'll live for you forever. In Jesus' name, amen.